I remember when our kids uh, were little, I still think they're little sometimes, but littler, uh, in the two-year-old range or so, I remember taking them to the, the, hospitals, uh, the hospital, the doctor's office, and um, bringing them in there and trying to comfort them because you knew what was about to happen. You knew that some doctor in this white mask perhaps was going to put a needle uh, in your, somewhere in your child and your child was going to look at you with eyes of what did you do to me as a parent and all we can do is try to comfort in the midst of it. And that, that's tough as a parent. And some of you remember those days. Some of you are probably in them right now. Some of you have no idea what that was like. But for the parents, it's very difficult to, you know, to take your kids in that situation where you know that they're going to be in major pain and it's going to last a while. And somehow in the midst of it, they're supposed to trust you and you comfort them, but they're looking at you and saying, you did this to me. I think for me, when it comes to going through suffering or trials or difficulties in our life, in some ways, I think God is a little bit like that. Not, not that God is the author of suffering, because he's not. Especially if you're a believer. Listen, you need to get this real clear. If you're a believer, God is not putting pain on you. I, I just don't believe that's biblical at all. But in the midst of the pain that you deal with and the suffering that you go through, God is there saying, listen, not only am I here to get you through it, but I'm here to make it glorious in you. I'm going to make something great out of it. And that's really the message to the Romans that we've been going over. But I understand now, there are different kinds of sufferings. There's some suffering that we go through that really is just because of us. And the Bible says that you, uh, whatsoever a man sows, that will he reap. And so some of it's just us. I, I know that. Some of the, sometimes the difficult, difficulties that we face are because we live in a simple world and cars break down and people break down and we get old and we're all supposed to die. And in order to die, things have to kind of fall apart. I get that. And, so, and some of it's spiritual battles, right? Some of it is, you know, Satan is talked about as an enemy who oppresses, and, and so we know that. But I'm still convinced that all of that, Scripture teaches us that God is faithful, and that God is good, and that God wants to not only get us through it, but wants us to be victorious in it. To the Romans, the Romans, uh, if you recall, I mentioned this last week, had just gone over some major, major persecution. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, prior to the writing of the book of Romans, they had all been kicked out of Rome. They lost their homes, their jobs, everything that they knew, their family, just because they were followers of Christ. And it's not only to the Romans that that happened to. As a matter of fact, New Testament believers, in general, you could expect this. You could expect someone who was probably going to get tortured, you're probably going to lose something you loved, and you very, very likely have dying, all because of your faith. That's like New Testament times. As a matter of fact, 10 of the 12 disciples were killed for following Christ. We know that Judas, Judas did what? Judas committed suicide. And John, we think, died at an old age. But look, listen to this. Andrew, and by the way, some of the stories, we're trying to figure out what exactly happened. There's a little different accounts, but we know that we're all killed. Andrew was crucified. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, um, was beheaded uh, or flogged alive. James the Greater was beheaded and stabbed to death. Um, James the Lesser was thrown from the pinnacle of the Temple of Jerusalem and then stoned and beaten with clubs. Jude, also identified as Thaddeus, uh, I believe was beaten uh, to death with a club. Matthew was burned, stoned, uh, and beheaded eventually. Peter was crucified at Rome uh, upside down. Philip was tortured and crucified. Simon was crucified and perhaps was possibly sewn in half. Thomas was stabbed with the spear to death. Hey, how is that to welcome to Christianity 101? Can, 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 we just, can we just get over this point? Can we just confess this maybe? Can we just suggest that 
trials that we face in 2016 probably look a whole lot different than trials that they faced in the first couple centuries. Is that, can we just say that's true? And can most of us agree that what we face for the most part is nothing like what the early church went through? Can we just say yes? Right? So, I mean, what we're going through, many of us, is nothing like what they went through. Just the same. Paul writes, Paul writes to the Romans and says, hey, listen, here's how I want you to deal with trials. But let me go ahead and read Romans chapter 5. And this is, if you have your, your gray Bibles in front of you, there's a Bible there. Uh, turn to page 1466. If you have an electronic Bible, your own Bible, I don't, I don't know what page that would be, but whatever it is. Um, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. So again, the gray Bible is 1466. And again, you know, take notes if you would. I, just make me happy for today. Speaking of happy... How about that Vikings game, huh? I know I did it. Shame on me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Therefore, so I really am sorry. I should have said that. Therefore, after the first four chapters of Romans talk about saved by grace, saved by grace, Faith in Christ alone, saved by grace, justified, redeemed. I mean, all these things we've been talking about for weeks and weeks. As a matter of fact, if you're newer here, I would encourage you to go to newlife906.com and look up some of the old messages we talked about because so much hinges on what happens over the next few weeks. Therefore, since we have been justified in right standing and good relationship with God through faith alone, not in our works, not in good behavior, not in how much you did devotions, anything, through faith alone, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So listen, when it comes to dealing with trials and suffering and difficulties, it's important to know this, that you're at peace with God as, as a believer. It's important to know that God isn't like saying, man, I, you messed up yesterday, so I'm just I'm going to make you suffer. I'm going to make you go through difficult times, and you, you, know, you, you, you wrong somebody, so I'm going to wrong you. That, that isn't how God operates with his kids. If you're a believer, you need to know that whatever you're going through in your life is not a result of the anger of God or the payback of God or God is emotionally upset or somehow dysfunctional. You're at peace with God the Bible says that God delights in you, that you are a friend of the Lord if you're a follower of Christ. Like, you have to know that. That's the basis of everything in our, in our walk. But then how do you find value? What do you still, how, what do you make of the suffering that you go through? How, do you, how does God get glory in it? Let, let's go on. Chapter 5, verse 1. Excuse me, verse 3. We boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. And I want to say, you're smoke and crack. Right? In older terms, you're crazy. Whatever place that you're at in your life, I'm just saying something doesn't sit right with me. As a matter of fact, if, if glorying your sufferings in, in that version isn't enough, some other versions say, hey, rejoice. Rejoice. Take joy in your suffering. Another version says, the New American Standard says, we exult in our tribulation. Out of your mind. And, and let me just say this. If, if this was the only verse in the Bible that said this, it would make more sense to me. It really would. Because that would be like, okay, um, context, you know, it's not throughout the rest of the Bible. Some verse in the Bible just plain hard to understand, right? Can we say that? And like, I don't know what that means. And that's the only place I don't really know. So like, if it said that, I would be like, okay, we have it. There's a lot of other verses. But it doesn't just say that in the only, that's not the only place it says it. I mean, the whole of Scripture has this idea of telling us to rejoice and to have joy 
in the midst of trials and tribulations and of suffering and on our deathbed. Matthew 5, 7 says this. Hey, in your suffering, and I would write these down in your notes if I was you. In your suffering, rejoice and be glad. So, hey, in your suffering, rejoice, be glad. James 1, 2 through 5 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of different kinds, because, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work, that you may be mature. So James says, hey, listen, consider it pure joy. Look at your suffering and your situation and go, man, I'm thankful in the midst of it because somehow God is going to get the glory and I'm going to be more mature. Like, that's hard for me to do. Anybody else? So I'm not alone then. That's good. So I mean, that's not even it. There's more. Colossians 1.21. Paul said this. Remember, Paul was beaten and abused and, and, and stoned to death and left for dead more than once. Here's what he says. I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. That's just crazy to me. 1 Peter 4, 12-14. Do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange was happening to you. This isn't unique to believers. This, this isn't weird. Don't be surprised at it. Verse 13, but rejoice, take joy, and then listen to this, that you get to participate in the suffering of Christ. <laughs> Mind-blowing. Take joy that you get to, like this is my privilege today, today I get to suffer with Christ. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, talks about the grace of God that's sufficient in you. And then Paul says this, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weakness. I delight in my insults. I delight in my hardships. I delight in my persecutions. I delight in my difficulties. And he says, why? Because when I am weak, and then he is strong. Suffering is whole different than what I think you and I have been taught. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, we run from it. Woo -hoo! Like, we just run as fast as we can from it. Any difficulty, any pain, anything that goes wrong, we take off, and just, that's it. And I'm not suggesting that we run to suffering. We would call that something like um, insane, masochism, stoicism. But Paul is saying that when I go through difficult times in my life, when... I get picked on, when I get tribulation times, when things don't work out for me, when I get called up aside, man, I take joy in it because, you know what, when I am weak, my God is strong in me. When I am decreased, he will increase. When I am brought low, he will be brought up. When I am away, he will be brought near. It's a whole different way of viewing difficulties. Don't you agree? So it isn't just simply, you know what, finding value and you're suffering by just grin and bear it. It's not just tough it out, man up, cowboy up, cowgirl up. It's not just hang in there, you've got this, pep talk. But actually saying and rejoice in it. Rejoice in it. So Paul tells us why. Why should you rejoice in your suffering? Why, why should you say, man, I thank God. I give God glory in it. Here's what Paul says to the Romans. Chapter 5, verse 3. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because... That's an important phrase in Scripture, this phrase, the phrase of because. It's linking the reason. I rejoice because suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance will produce character and character hope. 
And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So the message to us that goes to difficult times is, hey, listen, rejoice in the midst of it because, listen, because you're going to learn to persevere. You're going to grow and because God is going to get the honor because you will be a better believer and because God is going to do something in you and through you that's going to say, wow, if this wouldn't have happened, this wouldn't have happened. I mean, so in your notes, because. New Living Translation says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character and, char and character strengthens our confident hope in salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. First one, how do you find value in your suffering? You can find value because God can produce perseverance in us through it. And I use the word can because we don't have to receive it. You know what I mean? If we let God be glorified in the midst of our pain and trials, then perseverance can develop. There's something else that can develop too, but I'll talk about that later. The word perseverance means to abide under or to stay under pressure. Anybody know what the phrase bust a pipe means? I've asked a few of you, like, no one's heard of this, bust a pipe. Or break a pipe, bust a pipe. Let me explain the phrase to you. When a, when a pipe comes under a lot of pressure, and sometimes we get this when it's frozen, and there's this pressure, pipes what? They break. And so in terms of if you're a basketball player and, um, and you're supposed to take your free throw, and most of the time you would do it, you would say, and he misses it, you would say, pressure bust a pipe. Because if he missed it, the pressure of all the people around him busted the pipe. Are you, is that, you get the saying? Eh, not really. And it's important, though, because this is what it's saying, is that perseverance allows us to stay solid, moving in our trial, despite all the difficulties that we face. Another way you'd say it for football. In football, you know, there's this pass... And the guy's wide open. Man, he should be able to pull that thing in and easy touchdown. But because of the pressure around him in this community and the surroundings, pressure bust a pipe. He couldn't catch the pass. He dropped it. Anyway, forget it. Pressure bust. <laughs> like I'm teaching English. I don't anyway. As believers, when we allow God to work in our trials. He causes us to persevere. He causes us to grow. He causes us to say, you know what? I can keep going in it. I, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to give in to everything else around me. I'm going to keep my eyes focused on the cross, on Christ. Nothing else is going to betray me, perturb me, or get in the way. That's what trials can do in your life if you let them cause a spirit of perseverance to happen through it. I remember going through difficult times. Um, when I first got saved, you know, when I first got saved, I got this, I kind of had this idea that maybe you know, when you became a believer that life was really, like, simple? Or that maybe somehow, if as a believer, maybe somehow as a believer that maybe there'd be less trials that would at least come your way. And so I remember, I mean, I gave my life to Christ. Jesus forgive me, and he forgave me. And I had this idea that, man, life would pretty much be easy sailing after that. And then I had some trials come my way, and cars broke down and things happened. And I remember I kept thinking, man, what did I do wrong? What happened? Did I, did I mess up? Did I not pray enough yesterday? Did I not do my devotions? And I kept trying to find the reason for what was going on. And it dawned on, it dawned on me after a few years that, you know what? God is going to get me through this. That I said, it's like a, it's like a spiritual roller coaster. You know, some days I felt like God and me were up here. Then the next day I had troubles and trials, and I felt like God doesn't like me. And then great days with God, and then bad bad days. Perseverance allows us to say, despite what happens in my world, despite the difficulties I face, despite persecution, despite what people say, my place with God is a, is, it, is at a constant level perseverance in the midst of it. 
Not allowing the pressures and the trials of your life to cause you to give up your faith, but to be able to say, you know what, I praise him in the storm. Perseverance. Number two, if you let it, you will find value in your suffering because it produces character. Finding value in your suffering because it produces character. The Greek word for character here means that you were test, tested and approved. You were put to the test. You passed. You made it. It means to show reliable. Perseverance, when you keep holding through and you don't give up, and you don't call it quits, and you don't get persuaded, it will eventually produce character in you. Do you know what? We all know people that when you say something like, hey, can you be at this place at this time? We all know people that unless they're dead are going to be there. Right? Don't we know people like that? Yes. We would say they are people of character. Or if someone that, you know, when they give their word, when they say something, no matter what it is, no matter what it costs them, they're going to do it. Because they have learned to persevere through difficulties, and as a response of that, there's character there so that you can trust what they have to say, so you can trust what they, you know, where they're going. You can trust them in areas. Character. And as a believer, God isn't just okay with us getting saved, but God wants us to grow like Him, become like Christ. We said last week, we call it sanctification, that God is calling you to persevere so that in that perseverance, you'll be a person of godly character. That's how much He loves us. As a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 8, 10 says this, I think you ought to know, dear brothers, about the hard times that we went through in Asia. We were really crushed and overwhelmed and feared we would never live through it. I mean, he was beaten, he was stoned, he was, I mean, stuff that he went through was crazy. We felt we were doomed to die and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. Here's that stinking phrase again. But that was good. For or because then we put everything into the hands of God. Who alone could save us? I thank God that what we went through, I thank God that we were on the verge of death. I thank God that, that there was nothing left in us because in that moment, it dawned on me, I realized, I, I, I lived out the fact that I can no longer make it myself, that I can only do it through the power of Christ that's in me. Only He can get me through this thing. Character. But then, listen to what Paul says next. Who alone could save us? For He can even raise the dead. Hey, even if I die, He'll raise me, if He wants to. And He did help us. And he saved us from the terrible death. Yes. And then look at that. We expect him to do it again and again. So Paul is saying, listen, hey, man, not only did we go through trials one time and the difficulties we faced, but I just expect throughout the rest of my life it's going to happen again and again and again. And I just expect that God's going to come through in his timetable again and again. Paul had persevered through trials and tribulations until finally he had some character in him that said, I don't care what men say, what men do, or what men think. I'm going to serve God anyway. I don't care how I'm persecuted, how I'm tried. I don't care what disease I get. I don't care. When I decrease, he increases. Isn't that a whole new way of looking at our difficulties? Isn't it? We're just, and by the way, this is tough for me. I, mean, I, was, I was thinking about some of this stuff last night. Excuse me, Friday night. It is, I'm, you know, my wife is there laying in, in bed, and she is in more pain uh, than I've ever seen her in, ever. Uh, more than childhood. She said it was way more than childhood. The worst pain she's ever had. And to the point she said, I just want to die. I just want to die. I just want to die. And I'm looking, thinking about the, this whole message that I wrote. Like, how do you respond? It's easy to preach it when everything's going great. 
right? But it's more difficult to say, God, I, I, I rejoice in you. I love you. God, help somehow you get the glory in this thing in the midst of all she's sitting there. She said, she said that when she was there, she said, I just started praying for everybody I knew that would had it worse than I did. Often when we face trials, we, are, we see what we're really made of. And I think over the years, maybe I've grown in maturity. I hope I, hope I have. Finally, number three. Suffering, the value and difficulties and trials if you let the Holy Spirit do the work, can produce hope. Can produce hope. Look at verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's almost like it takes us full circle again. It started with a message of hope because God loves you unconditionally and it ends again with a message of hope that God still loves you unconditionally and as a matter of fact while you rejected him while you turned your back to him while you spit on his face and crucified him in that moment he died for you so in your suffering in difficult times don't give up Grow in character, but hold on to the hope of Christ. That he's returning, that he's coming again, that nothing can separate you from his love, and nothing can take you away from his protection. Nothing. He's faithful. What is the message to the Romans who had lost everything? Who are being killed? You can be made steady, reliable, and confident in God, or you can become bitter, resentful, angry, and come to the point where you even deny your faith. You all go through difficulties, you all go through struggles. The mature person says, hey, I'm going to give God the glory in the midst of it. And often maybe because of it. I have not in any way uh, made it if you will, in this area of my life. I said last week, I, I hate trials, I hate difficulties. Uh, I wanna get to the place where I just give God glory in the midst of it and say, God, man, you're gonna be faithful, I'm not even worried about it. That's the place I wanna get to. I'm not there, but that's where I wanna go. I want to be at the place in my life that no matter what happens, I just say, God, you know what? You're good. I love you. And in the end, it's always been about you. It will always be about you. Let me grow stronger in the midst of it. Because my temptation is sometimes I want to run away. I want to run away. As the worship team comes up this morning, I want to just ask you a quick question. And, um, I want to pray for you. If you have gone, if you have gone through, let me just say it this way. Maybe you're here today and you are currently going through some very difficult times in your life. And in the midst of those difficulties, 
you've really began to question the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, and even really how to respond. I just want to pray for you. Can I do that?